Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this Wigtown Book Festival event, wherever you are. My name's Stephanie Merritt, and it's my very great pleasure to be introducing you this evening to Maggie O'Farrell. Maggie, as I'm sure you will know, is a multi-award winning novelist. She's won the Somerset Maughan Award, the Costa Novel Award, and uh, most recently, she's won the Women's Prize for 2020. She's the author of eight novels and one best-selling work of nonfiction. And we're here to talk this evening about her most recent novel, Hamnet. Here it is. This is the winner of this year's Women's Prize. So uh, without further ado, Maggie, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm really well. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to have you. So um, before we start to talk about Hamlet, we're going to talk, um, well, I'm going to ask you to do a short reading to set the scene a little bit and give people a flavour of the book, if that's okay. Um, so I'm going to read from a section quite near the beginning of the novel, um, and it's where Hamlet, who's 11, and he's running around trying to find uh, a grown-up to help him because his twin sister has fallen ill. If there is a lot of noise in the background, I have to apologise. I have a, a sick cat who, well, she's supposed to be sick. She's not showing very much sign of sickness now, but it looks, if you hear jangling, it's her bell. She seems to have suddenly decided to uh, perk up and wants her 15 seconds of thing. So we'll just try and ignore her. The room is filled with gloom, coverings pulled over most of the windows. His grandfather is standing with his back towards him in a crouched position, fumbling with something, papers, a cloth bag, counters of some sort. There is a pitcher on the table and a cup. His grandfather's hand meanders through these objects, his head bent, his breath coming in bursts. Hamlet gives a polite cough. His grandfather wheels around, his face wild, furious, his arm flailing through the air as if warding off an assailant. Who's there? He cried. It's me, Hamlet. His grandfather sits down with a thud. You scared the wits out of me, he cried. Whatever do you mean, creeping about like that? I'm sorry, Hamlet says. I was calling and calling, but no one answered. Judith is unwell and they've gone out. His grandfather speaks over him with a curt flick of his wrist. What do you want with all those women anyway? He seizes the neck of the pitcher and aims it towards the cup. The liquid ale, Hamlet thinks, slops out precipitously, some into the cup and some onto the papers on the table, causing his grandfather to curse, then dab at them with his sleeve. For the first time, it occurs to Hamlet that his grandfather might be drunk. Do you know where they've gone? Hamlet asks. Eh? His grandfather says, still mopping at his papers. His anger at their spoiling seems to unsheath itself and stretch out from him like a rapier. Hamlet can feel the tip of it wander about the room, seeking an opponent. Don't stand there gawping, his grandfather hisses. Help me. Hamlet shuffles forward a step, then another. He is wary, his father's words circling his mind. Stay away from your grandfather when he's in, him, when he's in one of his black humours. Be sure to stand clear of him. Stay well back, do you hear? His father has said this to him on his last visit when they'd been helping unload a cart from the tannery. John, his grandfather, had dropped a bundle of skins into the mud and in a sudden fit of temper, had held a paring knife at the yard wall. His father had immediately pulled Hamlet back behind him, out of the way, but John had dodged past them into the house without a word. His father had taken Hamlet's face in both of his hands, fingers curled in at the nape of his neck, his gaze steady and searching. He'll not touch your sisters, but it's you I worry for, he had muttered, his brow puckering. You know the humour I mean, don't you? Hamlet had nodded, but wanted the moment to be prolonged, for his father to keep holding his head like that. It gave him a sensation of lightness, of safety, of being entirely known and treasured. At the same time, he was aware of a curdling unease swelling about inside him, like a meal his stomach didn't want. He thought of the snip and snap of words that punctured the air between his father and his grandfather, the way his father continually reached to loosen his collar when seated at the table. Swear to me, his father had said, as they stood in the yard, swear it. I need to know you'll be safe when I'm not here to see to it. Hamlet believes he is keeping his word. He is well back. He is at the other side of the fireplace. His grandfather couldn't reach him here, even if he tried. His grandfather is draining his cup with one hand and shaking the drops off a sheet of paper with the other. Take this, he orders, holding out the page. Hamlet bends forward, not moving his feet, and takes it with the very tips of his fingers. His grandfather's eyes are slitted, watchful, his tongue pokes out of the side of his mouth. He sits in his chair, hunched, an old, sad toad on a stone. And this, his grandfather holds out another paper. 
Hannah bends forward in the same way, keeping the necessary distance. He thinks of his father, how he would be proud of him, how he would be pleased. Quick as a fox, his grandfather makes a lunge. Thank you. Thank you. So that's sort of right. That's an introduction to uh, to your title character. Um, but tell us a bit about the the genesis of this novel, because I know that this boy Hamnet um, is someone who's fascinated you for a long time. And but perhaps you could tell us a bit about how you first encountered him and and what particularly caught your imagination about this this child. Well, it is. Yeah, it has been a really long time. Uh, it's probably about thirty years actually. So I studied the play Hamlet when I first, my hires, my Scottish hires, when I was, I was 16, I think, coming up to 17. And I had a really brilliant English teacher. I went to North Berwick High School and had this fantastic English teacher called Mr. Henderson. And he um, he just mentioned in passing one day when we were studying, and I suppose, I suppose I should say that the play really got under my skin. I really, um, as quite a lot of adolescents do, I think, I really felt as though... Uh, I was probably quite related to the, you know, the uh, Danish prince. There was a lot about him which I felt <laughs> echoed how I felt about the world. So I, I was already, I completely fell for the play, and it is still my favourite Shakespeare play and has remained so. But in passing, my teacher said in passing one day um, that Shakespeare had had a son called Hamnet uh, who died, I think, about four years before the play was written or the famous play was first performed. And it just, I don't know, even it just struck me in that moment, you know, the symmetry of the names, because they are, of course, the same name, because Elizabethan spelling was so unstable. Hamlet and Hamlet are interchangeable in Paris records of the time. So I have a really clear memory of sitting in a classroom and looking down at the play, my kind of school copy of the play, and just putting my finger over the L and thinking, but it's it's the same name. You know, what does it mean to call your probably most famous play, you know, your most famous tragedy, your famous tragic hero? I mean, actually, there are, you know, there are, there are two Hamlets in the play, of course, there's the young man and then there's the ghost and they're both Hamlet, the sort of name has been split into two. And what does that mean? What is it telling us? And, you know, I, I studied um, literature at university and it was only then that I began to realize that actually Shakespeare, the man is a very shadowy figure. You know, he's a, there's a real imbalance there because we have this enormous wealth of his work in his plays and his poetry, only thanks to his friends actually, not thanks to Shakespeare. Shakespeare didn't preserve them for posterity. But then it's in balance because we know so little about him. You know, he's an incredibly um, mysterious figure, really, his biography. There's very little we know about him. There's very little concrete facts. There are so many huge gaps and longueurs in his story that despite the best efforts of, you know, these incredible biographers and scholars, no one's ever been able to. I mean, no one's really can explain how this boy from a small, you know, this son of a glover from a small market town who only had a grammar school education. He probably was only in school to the age of 15 how he made that transition from being the Glover's son to, you know, the world's most celebrated playwright. Nobody really knows. Nobody knows how he got to London or why he went there or how he got onto the mm. stage. You know, it's all, it's mysterious. But it seems to me that this act, you know, calling, calling your play after your dead son is an enormously significant act. It's telling us a huge amount. It's a real kind of, um, it's one of the moments where the past reaches out and almost touches you you know you can see that it's it, it's it tells us a lot about how he felt I think about his son dying which is, it is an event that I always feel has been really overlooked and diminished by history and biographers uh you know Hamlet's lucky if he gets two mentions in a huge kind of 500 page biography and they mentioned he was born and they mentioned he died and usually his death is all wrapped up in statistics about infant your child mortality in the 16th century, which of course was very high, but almost as if the implication was that it wouldn't have been that big a deal because, you know, children were dying all the time. But I think that's a, a you know, a ridiculous assumption because of course he was, he, he was grieved very much. You only have to read the first few scenes of the play to realise that. Well, I think, and one of the things that I love about what you've done with this book is that you have brought that to the foreground, the, the domestic life of, Shakespeare that is you know as we as you say is so little known and and often so overlooked and although this is the story of of Hamlet of his son um it's almost in my reading I feel it's more the story of his wife who again is a figure who is very often misrepresented by by academics um or dismissed or uh, or overlooked completely um and so much of this is her story and it's it's although it's about fathers and sons, because that's 
what's reflected in the in the play. Um, a lot of this is about motherhood and it's about mothers and children and wives and husbands. And um, can you tell us a bit about the character of An Agnes and where she came from and and how you how you sort of landed on your version of her? Well, I think you know. I mean, if we think that Hamnet has been overlooked. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, the woman we know as Anne Hathaway, or has been, we've been taught to call Anne Hathaway, even though her surname was Shakespeare, obviously, for most of her life. <laughs> um, she's been so much, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, Shakespeare himself is very shadowy, and we know very little about him. There are very few documents pertaining to him, but actually there's even less about his wife. You know, she is a kind of, one biographer describes her as the wife shaped void. Um, but, you know, this, you know, the, the little that we do know about her hasn't stopped people from, rushing forward to uh, sort of give us all or teach us to have one kind of narrative about her. You know, if you stopped an average passerby on the street and said, what do you know about a woman Shakespeare marriage? They're probably likely to say a couple of things that she was a kind of strumpet and that she lured him into marriage, you know, because she was three months pregnant when they got married. She was older than him. You know, we're fed this kind of narrative um, and it's from a variety of sources. You know, it can be in biographers, it can be scholars, it can be screenwriters of plays, it can be other novelists. But this whole kind of range of people has been teaching us for a really long time that we did, I don't know where this desire to give the bar, a kind of retrospective divorce comes from, you know, people are so determined to say he hated her, you know, he had to run away to London to get away from her, he regretted his marriage, he, you know, they never slept together after the twins were born, you know, I mean, all this stuff, and I have no idea where it comes from, I mean, people will always cite, you know, the famous second best bed um, behest in the will as yeah. proof he loathed her, but, you know, to that I say, well, I'll hear the second best bed, but I'll raise you the fact that this was an interlineation, you know, if you look at his will, I mean, the will in itself is an incredibly dry, emotionless document. But you have to remember, the man was dying, possibly of typhoid, you know, and he was, he was, what, 52? So it was, I mean, you know, but he, even that, you know, the average life expectancy was 47. And he was obviously very ill. And there isn't any emotion for anybody in the will. It's, you know, if you think this is the last will and testament of probably the greatest, you know, the man who wrote the greatest words about love and affection um, of all different types that there isn't a shred of that in the will at all and you know the second best bed is squeezed in between two other lines um but also i would say to that you know at the end of his career when he was the equivalent of a multi-millionaire because he was a really good businessman um he chose when he retired he chose instead of staying in london i mean he could have set up house wherever he wanted to he chose to go back to stratford and live at his retirement with his wife and that to me doesn't speak of a man who regretted his marriage and, you know, every, pretty much every single penny he earned in London, um, he sent home to Stratford. So he chose, even at the end of his career, when he was very wealthy, he chose to live in really modest lodgings. But he sent all his money back. You know, he bought um, his wife and his two daughters an enormous mansion of a house in Stratford uh, a year after Hamlet died. It's called New Place. But it was, it was there. Somebody pulled it down, unfortunately. Um, but he also bought cottages and fields and farmland, which he leased out. So he was obviously a very successful you know, landlord actually in Stratford upon Avon, which always intrigues me. I always think whether his contemporaries in Warwickshire saw him as this kind of landlord of businessman, <laughs> whether really they had no idea kind of who he was or the person we know him to be now. They must have had a very different perception of him. But none of that again suggests that he hated his family or he didn't. And, you know, there's obviously there's a there's a very good reason why uh scholarship and biographies uh center on his life in London, but it seems to me that the most important event of his life, the biggest drama of his life happened in Stratford off stage, and that was the death of his son. But, you know, I, so I felt really, um, I don't know, I felt quite sort of angry on behalf of his wife, I don't, because I never found any evidence for all this approach yeah. and sort of bit of hatred and actually downright misogyny, really. Um, and so I decided I wanted to give them this kind of, I, I wanted to sort of uh, ask readers to forget everything they think they know about her and kind of open themselves up to a new interpretation and one of the documents I read was her father's will. So her father, Richard Hathaway, died a year before she married William. And in it, he gives her a very generous dowry. And he refers to her as my daughter, Agnes, or Agnes, it would have been pronounced then. Um, and that was a kind of <laughs> sort of a sort of thunderbolt moment, because I thought, you know, not, as well as everything else, have we been calling her by the wrong name for almost half a century? You know, because surely if anyone knows her name, it's going to be her dad. 
So I just wanted to, I wanted to give, you know, sort of present the idea in this book that actually their marriage was a true marriage. It was a love match. They had this kind of, it was a partnership. And there's a kind of exchange of artistry, you know, because a lot of biographers have made a huge deal over the fact that she was probably illiterate. You know, she was stupid. She was an ignorant peasant. Um, and she probably couldn't. I mean, you know, what what daughter of a sheep farmer probably would have learned to read in, you know, the early 16th century? It's unlikely. But, you know, it's obvious that being illiterate doesn't necessarily mean you're stupid. So I wanted to give her an artistry of her own. And there's an awful lot of metaphors of hawking in um Shakespeare's play so I, I gave her uh, this this uh, uh, skill and so she has a catastrophe at the beginning of the book and also uh, it's always intrigued me actually Shakespeare's knowledge or the depth of his knowledge about herbology and plants uh, particularly in Hamlet of course where the scene where the madophilia gives people plants and they're, they're very accurate cures for some kind of character flaw that these people have um, and so I decided to give that to her because I wanted her to have her own her own brand of intelligence that pay, perhaps wasn't literary, but was perhaps a bit of a different kind. Well, and what you've done in the, the sort of the flashback episodes of the book where you show their meeting is to, to flip around that balance of power. So, I mean, one of the, I, I think one of the, the, your really interesting choices in this book is never to name him. He is the Latin tutor. He's her husband. He's Hamlet's father, but he's never given his own name. So all of the weight of association that comes with with the name Shakespeare isn't there. And, and when they first meet, she's the local celebrity, really. She's the one that is well known in Stratford because she has these healing gifts and because she's, uh, you know, she's a little bit unusual. She's more of a free spirit, perhaps, than a woman might be expected to be. Why did you decide to, to leave him sort of, to leave him shadowy in that sense? Well, I think, I mean, the, the decision not to name him was sort of twofold, really, because you know, as you say, just the surname, the surname Shakespeare never appears anywhere in the book at all. Um, but, you know, just it, it carries such heft, you know, and it carries such associations. You know, we all have our own relationship with Shakespeare inside our head. You know, he pervades our very language. He alters the way we think about ourselves and think about others you know, and, and kind of continues to do so with every single new production you might see. So in a sense, I wanted, again, I wanted to sort of divorce him from his name and his sort of status as an icon and as a genius and just try and see him as a man, you know, as a, as a young bloke of 18, you know, he was 18 when he got married and she was 26, you know, which I think in those days was quite unusual. I mean, she 26 was a kind of average age of a bride to the altar. But he was quite young, so they had to have a special license in order to get married. But actually, interestingly, um, Jermaine Greer has written a really brilliant book about her. Uh, it's called uh, Shakespeare's Wife. And in it, she says that actually people have been asking the wrong question about this marriage. They've always been asking, why did he marry her? Why did this genius boy stoop to marry this you know, ignorant yeah. sheep farmer woman? And she says it's the wrong way around. We should have been asking, why did she marry him? You know, because she, her family was um, quite well-to-do. Her father was a yeoman. He, I mean, he died a year before, but he was, he was pretty kind of respectable. They had, they had a good income. They had lots of land. Uh, whereas, and she was also of marriageable age and she had a good dowry. Whereas actually um, his family, his father had had this big fall from grace because he'd been a high alderman. He'd been very successful glover. But at the point at which he, they get married, um, his fortunes have taken a, quite a, a dive, quite a nosedive. Um, he has been illegally trading in wool. He's been stripped of his high alderman title. He, um, is also, he gets also involved in all sorts of weird sort of legal wrangles, one, is, one of which is he, he fails to turn up at church, um, which, uh, you know, having been a high alderman, that's quite a strange thing to do, because obviously going to church was compulsory. You had mm. to go every single week and get, get proof that you're going. Um, and he'd also, he'd been fined for leaving, well, actually what's described as audio on Henley Street. <laughs> I can imagine what that was coming from a, a, a gloving workshop probably really unpleasant so it was just all this bizarre sort of slightly odd behavior which made me think you know John Shakespeare is an interesting character um and actually you know if you consider that William's paper trail is pretty scant John's paper trail is enormous yeah <laughs> all kinds of documents you can see about him usually about him behaving badly or getting caught up in legal problems so actually in that you know the status of his family was her, was quite low at this point and I I think, um, I'm sure I read some of that the younger brothers probably wouldn't have been able to go to grammar school because they wouldn't have been able to afford to send them. So, you know, so it is interesting. It's an interesting balance of power, I think, that Jermaine Greer certainly picks up on. You know, why did this quite well-to-do wealthy woman of age marry this penniless 18-year-old from with no trade and from a quite sort of disgraced family? And, and your version, in your version, it's because she 
she has kind of gifts. She has these sort of slightly, it's almost kind of hinted at that she has kind of um, slightly witchy gifts, but she sees something in him. Yeah, she I sees just wonder, I mean, I was his just potential. To, yeah, I was just trying to imagine what he would have been like at 18, you know, what it would have been like to, for him, you know, knowing him as the person we know him to be and the extraordinary gifts he has. I mean, it's not only that he is, you know, the greatest writer that ever lived. It's not as if anyone's even really coming close, you know, it's not as if there are many sort of... Uh, rivals to who are going to snatch that crown from him you know and I just wonder what he what he would have been like you know in rural Warwickshire in the 16th century um the son of a glover I mean he must have been extraordinary even though he must have stuck out like a sore thumb in some ways and I mean I probably thought he was quite odd I imagine yeah. I mean, what would it be like being his rhetoric teacher at school or you know I just I was just trying to imagine what it would be like and maybe maybe there would have been people who'd seen him as extraordinary or maybe there would have been people that thought he was a bit bit of a freak and what were the challenges in writing? Because this is your first, I mean, you've, you've, dabbled, you've sort of dabbled with historical fiction in the past before, but this is your first proper full historical novel. What, what were the challenges in terms of um, how you went about writing it and, and researching it? Well, actually, I feel, I feel kind of anxious talking about this to you, Stephanie, who's such a kind of skilled historical novelist. This is my first, first story. I mean, I think the first thing I did um, was not to kind of, not to try and be conscious about the fact that it was sort of history of the capital H in a sense. I don't know if you do this with your books. I just tried to kind of approach it as I would any novel. I mean, already there was quite a lot of sort of um, weight and vertigo for writing about, obviously writing about Shakespeare himself. So I had to kind of try to ignore that vertigo. And I also had to try and ignore the vertigo that this was sort of history. And I think that, I think I was trying to, I was trying to look at, I was trying to address it certainly as a novel really, rather than something historical. And I, I was looking at historical novels that I really admire and it's always the ones um, that wear their history very, very lightly that don't, you know, there are some books which I, you know, I feel that everything is brilliant and the author's done a fantastic job, but there's something, there's quite a, there's quite a lot of, I'm going to tell you all, all about my research mm. on this topic. And that really, I, I always find that really, uh, painful actually when I'm reading a historical novel and suddenly I turn a page and I feel as I'm reading a PhD suddenly they want to tell me they want to show me they've done mm. their work you know they're showing their workings so I think you know I don't know if you find this when you're writing your books but I feel you have to do a huge amount of research to kind of give yourself confidence to inhabit that room or that space or these clothes or that time but actually you have to kind of cut out almost probably 95% of it you've got yeah. to keep the novel very light um, so that was interesting and I think I think one of the things that really intrigued me one of the books I really loved actually a historical novel is uh, The Sisters Brothers by Patrick DeWitt I don't know if you've read that but yeah. it's, it's an incredible novel because you know it's about sort of um, contract killers in sort of the wild west and in a sense it could be it sort of could be seen as a historical novel but actually it it sort of it's almost irrelevant that the, the time so it was a hundred odd years ago it wears it so lightly it's almost it's almost invisible and I thought that was a brilliant way to um approach the genre in a sense um so well you know I did have to kind of try but the thing is you know there's such there's an awful lot you need to know but you have to you have to kind of forget you know quite a lot of it I think or you've got to keep editing it out I think in a sense because you don't want your readers to get distracted and bogged down by too much information about how gloves were made in the 16th century <laughs> It, but, and yet at the same time, it is those details that, that place the reader, you know, the things like the smell of a Glover's workshop and, and yeah. the weight of, uh, there's an ex a scene, just a very ordinary scene where the um, Agnes's sisters are wringing out a sheet and the, uh, just the idea of how heavy a sheet, a wet sheet would have been and how it took three of them to, to do the laundry. Um, but I know that you also have done some quite immersive research in terms of um, not just a book learning, but you know, but you you actually took up um, falconry and and uh, gardening, and perhaps you could tell us a bit about how that came I did, about. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, obviously, there's no shortage of books about Shakespeare. Um, you know, you could spend the rest of your life reading about him. So, in, in terms of um, that kind of research, you know, there was a lot of library-based research, obviously, um, and I tried where possible not to. Uh, ignore any kind of factual detail that I could find. So it wasn't, I didn't want to be the kind of writer that discovered that, I don't know, uh, well, say for example, there's evidence that Shakespeare himself was in Kent on tour, um, with, with, to tour with his company at the time that Hamlet dies. 
And I didn't want to ignore that. I didn't want to be the kind of person who thought, well, that's that's inconvenient. I want them to be in London you know, yeah. on the barge. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to stick to what there is now. You've got to stick whatever facts you can. So I gathered as much as I could about these kind of um, this sort of stretch of years in his life where possible. Um, but equally, you know, I think in order to, you know, I think those, particularly the lives of the women um, in the books so of Shakespeare's mother and uh, Agnes, uh, they are, of course, very undocumented, <laughs> as we know. You know, they're very, they don't really make it into the biographies, particularly, um, partly because most of his, you know, the life that's significant to scholarship happened in London. So in order to kind of feel that, you know, because I realised the sort of, you know, the gulf between my life as a woman in the 21st century and their lives as women in the 16th century is so enormous, you know. Um, I mean, just what you were saying about the sheet, you know, I was just kind of mulling on the fact that, I mean, Shakespeare's mother, Mary Arden, uh, has, so at the time Shakespeare married, who's 18, she had eight kids, a living kid. She'd already had um, two daughters who died in infancy, and then William was born, and then there was another daughter who died aged seven. Um, so she had these children, and the youngest was two at this point, you know, so you have an 18-year-old who's about to get married, and then you have children almost every couple of years down to a toddler. I mean, you think about the, just the sheer sort of, um, I don't know, labor involved in running that household. You know, you think about every single thing those children wear, everything they eat, everything they sit on, everything they eat off, you know, the cleaning, you know, the laundry. I mean, it's just astounding, really, when you think about it. And they, you know, the household, they would have had an apprentice living with them. They probably would have had a couple of uh, maid servants. They might have had someone to look after the pigs. You know, it's just absolutely, you know, the, the sort of tasks involved in the day-to-day -day running of that house is, is just jaw-dropping to someone like me. So in order to kind of write properly, I felt about, particularly about Agnes's life, I needed to kind of, um, I needed a sort of different kind of research was needed. So I did learn to fly a kestrel. Um, and I also, you know, it's partly because I, I, you know, I I had, I think I'd flown a kestrel once on a school trip when I was about seven. And I had remembered it being quite a big bird. And so I'd written a scene where, She's going out, uh, you know, doing her falconry, and the bird lands on her glove with a thud. And then I went and learned to fly a kestrel. And <laughs> as an adult, flying a kestrel, my kestrels are tiny; they're really tiny, and they're about the weight of a kitten. So I realised as I was actually doing it, I was holding it, and it landed on my glove. But it, it's almost imperceptible, you know. And they're so extra; they fly with such silence and such stealth that one minute they're there, one minute they're not there. So I had to come back and completely rewrite that scene, <laughs> get rid of the third, because that's the, yeah, it just wasn't accurate. But I also, um, I went mudlarking along the Thames. So I literally got my hands in, in the soil, got very dirty, and that was fantastic. I loved that. I mean, it wasn't, probably wasn't entirely relevant, but certainly I went, I visited particular Tudor dumps and kind of digging about in the soil. And you do find, you find these little tiny brass pins, which were used to pin up people's hair and to keep their rough on and I mean that's extraordinary physical connection to actual yeah. sort of tiny household objects that people would have had all over their person um and I also uh planted and cultivated an Elizabethan herb garden a sort of medicinal garden um because every household would have had one and the character Agnes she has particular skill in herbology um and you know I, there's only so much you can learn from books about that because you can read you know um they use comfrey to ease swollen joints, but it's not until you actually got the comfrey seeds and uh, planted them and cultivated them and kept the weeds away and watered them. <laughs> and then I went on a course to learn how you uh, turn these plants into medicine. But it's not until you've actually done that can you really understand it, can you write about it with confidence. Well, let's talk about the um, the medical aspects of the novel because uh, this, uh, you couldn't possibly have foreseen, but this novel has acquired um, an extraordinary pertinence in that um Hamlet I don't think it's a spoiler to say that Hamlet dies it's right there in the in the prologue um Hamlet dies but and, and it's supposed that he dies of the plague and so you've got all sorts of um information in there about what happens when somebody dies of a highly contagious disease and and how the burial works and how people have to respond to that and how the household has to be isolated and um there's an extraordinary passage in the middle of the book that's where it becomes almost sort of magic realism, where you you look at the the plague being you know the plague that kills Hamlet, and you sort of follow its journey all the way to Stratford. Um, can you tell us a bit about what, where that came from, that middle part of the book, and and also what kind of you know what you learned about how that community dealt with with plagues and um, pandemics at the time? 
I mean, I should say, the first thing I should say is that it's not known what the real Hamlet Shakespeare died of. You know, his, his burial is recorded, but there's no cause of death recorded at all. But he did die in high summer in August, and he did die in a plague year. So it's it, it's possible he died of plague. But, you know, obviously there's no, unfortunately, there's no shortage of things that could have killed you in 1596. Mm. Um, so it isn't it isn't known, but it's but also the thing that has always intrigued me actually about um, or one of the things that she's always intrigued me about Shakespeare is that you know despite his enormous output, you know, the huge number of plays and poetry, and the enormous kind of range he's always displayed in terms of theme and metaphor um, that he you know his sort of range of metaphors is extraordinary. His knowledge and the number of subjects he sort of employs. He never, ever, ever once in any of his plays or poetry mentions what we now call the Black Death. Um, he mentions pestilence and he mentions plague with, with obviously with a, a lowercase p as a plague on both your houses. But he isn't referring to what we now think of as the Black Death, which I've always found really extraordinary. It feels like a very uh, loud absence. You know, if you think about how uh, prevalent it was, you know, I mean, there's a there's an entrance in the Stratford upon Avon uh, register three months after William Shakespeare is born, um, and it's just three words. It said "hit insipit, hick insipit, pestis." Which here begins plague, and then about um, sort of three hundred people in Stratford upon Avon die, including a family of four down the road from Henley Street. You know, Shakespeare as an adult, his life, um, his career would have been constantly interrupted by the plague, because of course the first thing. Yeah. The civic authorities did if there was a case of plague in London was to shut down the playhouses. I mean, if you think that the original Globe Theatre had a capacity of 3,000 people, you know, and all those 3,000 yeah. people were gathering in the middle of the day for the light in maybe the hot summer, you can see why it would be, you know, a horrible breeding ground for uh, um, the Black Death or, you know, any number of uh, illnesses. So he would have had to, you know, if the plague wasn't, if the plague outbreak wasn't too um, extensive, he would have had to take his company on tour to keep the money coming in in uh, counties around London, which is probably where he was in Kent when Hamlet died. Um, or if it was a really serious outbreak, he would probably have you know, been confined to his lodgings in uh, London, or he would have gone home to Stratford, I, I guess. Um, so it was, you know, it was something that would have been absolutely at the forefront of every single Elizabethan's mind. They would have all known what the signs were and what the symptoms were. They would have all been aware that this was a disease that could kill a healthy young adult in 24 hours. Um, and if it happened, you know, if you had a case in your house and there would have been a watchman stationed at your door and you wouldn't have been allowed to go out and nothing would have been allowed to come in for 40 days. And sometimes whole towns were shut down. I read something about the city of Oxford being completely shut down and quarantined um, for months actually. And there were watchmen stationed on all the roads, not allowing any inhabitants to come out and anything to come in. I mean, actually that's where we get our word quarantine from, uh, from the Italian for 40, 40 days quaranta because it originated in Venice. It was a, a practice that the Venetians invented when obviously uh, people came off ships that had some nasty disease. So it is, you know, I mean, it's, it is, it is an intriguing subject. And certainly, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't foresee the pandemic. <laughs> I didn't foresee the opposite. So it is, it's odd now, actually. I mean, it's, you know, there are books, I don't know if you find this, Stephanie, but usually when you finish a book, you know, you do your final copy edit and your final draft and, and you turn over the last page. And in a sentence, in those circumstances, usually your relationship with it is, is finished. You know, your involvement in it is done and your relationship with it is set. But with this book, it, it has sort of altered actually since, since at about the time, you know, it was published on the 31st of March. That so was the first week of lockdown. And mm. March was a kind of a strange month for all of us, you know, because I do remember I had I bought this vintage dress to wear to the book launch and to wear to various events that I was going to do in the <laughs> bookstore. And I was taking it to the dry cleaners on the sort of second week of March and thinking, oh, well, everything's going to be fine. But then by the time I picked it up by five days later, it was really clear that oh, everything was off. You know, the book tour wasn't going to yeah. happen. The party wasn't going to happen. The dress was, there was no need for the dress. Um, so it was, you know, everything turned very, very quickly um, as it, you know, as it, but, you know, when I look back to the chapter, particularly the chapter I wrote about the flea, you know, it, it, it does seem odd. You know, I had for months, actually, I had, these big um, these maps of Elizabethan trade routes and the paths of infection um, that came from China. Most of the, um, the waves of the Black Death in that time did, did originate in China and kind of made their way across Europe. I mean, they did knock out, I think it's a third of the world's population. So when you look at the kind of maths of these um, the statistics of these uh, 
pandemics at those times, it's, it's absolutely staggering. You know, the number of deaths, it's, it's horrifying. Um, it's obviously, it makes our pandemic look positively puny, <laughs> you know, by comparison. Yeah. Um, and I know we didn't, you know, they didn't have ventilators and the NHS and, you know, lots of antiviral medication, but, you know, it was, it was an absolutely horrifying pandemic when you um, examine, you know, I mean, even where I live in Edinburgh, you know, you can see the mark of it on cities. You can see it everywhere in London. You can hear it in the streets' names. You come across those little kind of pockets of green space, often kind of triangular or rhomboid shape in the city of London. And you know that the reason why they haven't been developed is because beneath your feet uh, is a huge plague pit. You know, you can hear it in the names of the street. And here in Edinburgh, there's a park where my children, that all the children around here, learn to cycle their bikes because they have these little dips and hollows. And those are plague pits. There's a, I have a friend who has a garden, and in the front garden is is a gravestone and, it, and it's from a plague death. You know, the whole area of South Edinburgh that I live in was a place where the plague victims were brought and, you know, nursed until they died. So it, it is, you know, it's everywhere in, in certainly in, in Europe, I think. And I think it's, um, you know, what's strange is that I look back at the maps that I had up on my wall when I was writing the, the chapter about the flea making its way towards Warwickshire. And they look exactly like the infographics we were looking at in February and March, you know, when we were realising that it was in Italy and then, you know, I think obviously we all, I think once it was in Italy, I think everybody in Britain certainly knew that it was, it was, there's only a matter of time till it came here. So it is, it is a strange, but in a sense, I feel sort of, uh, I feel a kind of closer empathy with the Elizabethans because, yeah. you know, whenever I think I sort of feel fed up because I think, well, I'll, I don't know, when can I go for a dinner with my friends? <laughs> I think, you know, actually we're not doing too badly. <laughs> you know, I, this yeah, is a, I think that. Quite, that is the extraordinary thing about historical fiction, I think, is that it, it, it can acquire resonances that, you know, that we didn't expect to have because everything is kind of constantly echoing. Um, I would just wanted to ask you um, about, you were talking earlier about how different your life was from the lives of the women in the book. And yet at the heart of this, um, at the heart of this novel, there is, uh, it's about a mother's grief for her child and, and her father's grief as well. But I think the scene, there's a scene with Agnes after Hamlet has died, which I, to me, was one of the most difficult things to read in, in a good way. You know, it was one of the most heartbreaking things I've, I've read in fiction in recent years. And, you know, as the mother of a son, and I know that, that you are also the mother of a son, and I know that that's partly why you delayed writing the book for so long, because there was a sort of superstition about that. Um, can you just tell us a bit about how that uh, that experience of writing that particular scene and the scene of Hamlet's death and and what that was like as an author and and as a and as a parent as well? I mean, it was certainly. I you know I don't think of myself as a superstitious person, but uh, there was a reason why. I mean, I, I did I did sort of think about writing. I've been thinking about writing this novel for a really long time, and I did make a couple of attempts you know I read an awful lot about Shakespeare and I made I made a couple of stabs at it but actually the thing like you say the thing that put me off was I have I have a son and two daughters like the Shakespeare is my son's the eldest so it's a different um ordering but I found that actually I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to write this book while he was below the age of 11 while he was still yet to pass into his 12th year um I just I don't know because I knew that I was going to have to put myself inside the mind or the body of a woman who has to sit at her son's bedside. And I knew that she was going to have to lay him out for burial. And I just didn't think I could do that while my son was still younger than that. I don't know. It just felt, it felt too much like tempting fate. Not that there was a huge risk of him contracting the black death, but you never know. Um, so that, that was something that, that put me off, but it was, I mean, they are, I mean, it's strange, you know, I was looking back actually in my diaries not, not too long ago, actually, when I, for something else, I was looking for something else, and I just found this empty blank page, and it all it had written on it was, I killed Hamlet today. And I, I do remember that point in the book where I was coming closer and closer to that sort of point, and I, <laughs> I kept sort of ducking back and thinking, I should probably just fix the beginning again. I should probably just edit, you know, chapter three. <laughs> I was sort of trying to, trying to avoid doing it. You know, it's a bit like... Um, it felt a bit like, uh, I don't know, that experience that we watched Romeo and Juliet and you think, can it please be different this time? Can they just not listen to the <laughs> thinking prior? You know, just please. And you just always, but you know, that that is the fact. You know, there is, you can, I couldn't get around the line of his burial in the in the register. And, 
you know, it, his death is so significant. You know, I don't think without his death, we would have Hamlet. And I don't think we would have Twelfth Night, you know, which of course is that boy and girl twins who are, you know, who are separated and they both think the other's dead and then they're magically reunited. And that was written, I think it was first performed a year after Hamlet. They think, oh, that's the way the Globe and London yeah. uh, order it. So I don't, you know, it, it, it was it was a strange one, but I found that I couldn't write those scenes um, in the house where my children live. I, I had to write them. I, actually, I wrote them in the garden. I wrote them in a kind of, in a shed. And I, it wasn't a glamorous, nice shed. It was actually a really disgusting, dilapidated old potting shed that has actually since blown down. Um, but there was kind of a leaky roof filled with spiders and kind of manky bits of compost. So I did it in kind of short, sort of 15 20 minute bursts, then I'd have to have a walk around the garden and then I have to go back and try it again. So it was, yeah, they were difficult, but you can't, you know, as you yourself will know, you can't swerve away from it. You know, that's the, the, the reason why I wanted to write the book was to give him a, a voice and a presence and a significance. And you can't do that without, without properly talking about his death. And you've written, I mean, your, your work of nonfiction, your memoir, um, I am, I am, I am, that's a, a it's a book all about mortality and your own brushes with it and and also that of your children and I just wondered if that had informed the way you wrote these scenes in any way the the experiences that you've sort of brought to bear on that possibly yeah I mean you know I think in this to an extent all books you write are a kind of reaction to their predecessor you know and I think in a way they're all a bit like building blocks you can't you know there's so much you learn from writing a book you know with every book I always try to do something different you know to give myself a kind of challenge or a new hurdle to to try and clear um and I think you know I, I think I think you learn a huge amount during writing but and then I think that's the thing that that's the kind of urge that keeps you writing I think you want to put whatever it is you've learned into practice um so perhaps in a sense I yeah I don't think I probably couldn't have written Hamlet unless I'd written I am, but then I probably couldn't have written I am unless I'd written one before. And I think it goes back and back and back. You know, I think they all sort of feed off each other in a way and sort of rest on each other's shoulders. Well, I'm just keeping an eye out for um, to see if we've got any questions coming in from um, people who are listening. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to ask you what it's been like having a book come out um, during this uh, these strange times of lockdown and, and whether it's um, meant that you've had to engage more with the online world because uh, you're, you kind of famously don't do any social media which I'm enormously kind of envious of your discipline in, in not getting involved with that but has has the fact that we've all been remote kind of trying to engage remotely has that changed at all your your um engagement with the online I mean, world it, no, it is completely different and you know as, as you'll know you know because you had a book out in in July it was but um but you know I think you know the usual pattern is you spend I don't know two years or three years at home in your pajamas talking to your imaginary friends and then you get to go out into the world and <laughs> meet real people and go on trains and you know meet readers and and that, you know, that is lovely you know it's a, it's a brilliant sort of uh counterbalance to all the years you spend talking to your imaginary friends um but it, you know, it is odd because it's a strange experience. Because you know, obviously, we're all we're all at, you know, we've all been at home for a while. So I did have to learn. I'm not as you and as you say, I'm not very technically. I had to buy a new laptop, which I'm actually talking to you on right now, because my, la my laptop I've been using up to then was uh, 13 years old, and it wasn't. Wow. <laughs> was not able was not able to do any kind of zoom so while I did zoom on my phone so I had this little tiny tiny postage stamp person so now I have I have treated myself to a new laptop which is quite exciting but I'm st yeah still not very I still yeah I'm still not engaging with social <laughs> social media despite now having the uh, the technology to support it is that because you do you work best when you're kind of shut away and immersed in the world of your novel and was that and was that particularly important for this book yeah, probably. I mean, I do. I have. I mean, I still actually, <laughs> I still write on my thirteen-year-old laptop, which has no connectivity at all. I think I just find it a bit distracting, um, and I try just to avoid any, any kind of pinging and distractions and uh, email. I have nothing at all on that laptop, um, so I do all the kind of emailing and my. I buy a lot of things on eBay <laughs> on my on my other my other computer. So I do try. I really try to avoid distraction but I think I don't know about social media I mean it's not something I think I I'm slightly wary of it because it's sort of chronophagic you know it's I feel as though it might suck my time away and I feel I you know my time is so 
you know, like, yeah, I have kids and I have a job and, you know, all this kind of stuff. I have, I have so, I've got to really ring fence my writing time and I'm very sort of, uh, I'm quite, I sort of defend it quite fiercely <laughs> and anything that sort of impinges on that. I, it's got, you know, I, I just, and I also feel as a, you know, you only have so many, I don't know, so many words in your tank and I would rather spend them, I think in my novel, actually, I would rather use them for my no novels or fiction than I would on anything else, I guess. And having done this book, are you now uh, tempted to, to stay with historical fiction? Is there a sense that that's going to be what's expected or are you, is the next one going to be something completely different? Well, it took me a while. I couldn't decide actually which one, which to write next. And I, so I did something which I've done before actually. I have two, <laughs> two desks in my study, two desks, two computers in my study. And I was, I, for a while I wrote one novel on one desk and then I would write another on the other one just to see which one sort of, I don't know, uh, which one the pilot light I felt was burning most brightly. Um, and actually what, <laughs> what happened this time is I was writing away on these two things and then I had this other idea, a third idea, where I thought, no, this is the one. So I just got rid of both of those and started this other third one that's just lying. But um, it is actually set in the past, but I can't, I can't really say anything. I'm very superstitious. I don't know if you're the same talking about things that I haven't finished yet. So I can't really say <laughs> too much about it. Otherwise, I always feel like if I talk, talk about it, then I, 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 I won't want to write it anymore. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. So we've got a question uh, that's come in from Julia, um, again on on the um, the chapter about the plague and uh, and its parallels with with what's happening now. And and she asks, what do you feel reflecting on this writing given the current situation? I know we've touched on that, but has it given you insight? I, mean, I think thinking about it now, I feel. I suppose it goes back to what I was saying about I feel that we're very lucky in a sense actually that we have modern medicine and that we have we have an understanding of where it comes where you know coronavirus has come from and how it's spread because the Elizabethans had no idea you know they thought it came from rags or they thought it came from they had some sense that it was sort of then they thought it came from the air there was all this whole theory about miasmas that's why plague doctors wore these terrifying cone masks that were stuffed with herbs they thought they didn't breathe it in and of course, that's not true. I mean, I think there probably there were sort of unhealthy miasmas around, but of course, we all know now that it was a flea, but that was only discovered, I think, I think it was at the beginning of the 1900s or something. You know, it was only then that they realised what it was, that it was this kind of contact from fleas that were travelling on rats that were travelling, you know, and that's, yeah. I find that really heartbreaking, looking back at them, thinking they were struggling, these poor people were struggling to work out where this terrifying disease was coming from, what it meant, you know, how they could stop it. And none of them had any idea. So I feel that we are, we are really lucky because we do, you know, we have scientists who can tell us how it spreads. They can tell us, you know, give us proper practical advice about how to <laughs> help ourselves and help others. And we have doctors and we have medicines and we have, you know, uh, so I feel that we're lucky actually compared to them. I think they, they had, life was very, very, very hard for them in many ways. I really feel like we should reintroduce the, the plague masks. Uh, I think, especially on public transport, I'd, I'd be a big fan of those. Um, there's a question that's come in from, uh, from Julie Gilligan, who says, I'd love to know of all the characters Maggie has created, which one is your favorite or the one who's stayed with you the longest? And she says, hers is Esme Lennox. Oh, that's nice. Um, I don't know, it's a bit hard actually. It would be a bit like saying, which is my favorite child? <laughs> course, <I'm> <laughs> you, you can tell us, just between us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a favorite child. So it's a tricky one actually. I mean, I think, you know, I think every book and every character sort of represents a sort of uh, a particular phase in my life or a particular sort of set of interests that I had at the time. I would all, I would say actually to Esme Lennox, I, I'm very fond of her. I think she's probably the character who's <laughs> I've ever created who's most like me. <laughs> <laughs> even though she's from the, the 1920s but um yeah it's really it's really hard to say I feel very connected to all of them actually I mean it's not that I I don't I don't really look back at my old books and read them I mean, in a sense I don't really have to I sort of still know them in a way but um yeah I, I don't feel I, I kind of have a real connection and a fondness for all of them in a way which is it's not a very helpful answer that is it sorry uh and we've got another question from Kirsty McDougall who says how do you organise your writing time and how do you begin? Which we'd all like to know. Well, not being on social media. <laughs> it's a big... I mean, I, I should say, first of all, the idea of organising and writing time in the same sense. <laughs> it's not, very, it's not, very, uh, not a very realistic way to look at it. I'm really, really unorganised in every way. 
in life and in writing. Um, but I think in a sense, I think you shouldn't think about it too, too much. I mean, I think, I think what I would say is that you need to, as I was, it goes back to what I was saying about, you need to really fiercely ring fence at any time you have. Um, you know, and I've been writing, my eldest child is 17, my youngest is eight. So I've been having, I had, I've had quite small kids in the house for quite a lot of my, uh, in the last two decades really. And that, and that's obviously very <laughs> tricky, but the thing you have to do about writing is you have to completely ignore, you've got to develop a very good sense of just walking past sort of piles of laundry or ignoring the washing up, <laughs> just not minding if the house scratches it gets dustier and dustier, you know, you've got to focus on what's important and, that, and that's obviously keeping your children alive number one and number two is <laughs> getting your getting your getting words down on paper and I think everything else can kind of you know has the housework will still be there next week <laughs> and the thing about housework is you do it and then you just have to do it again you know it's just exactly <laughs> really so yeah and I think but begin I think beginning is really hard actually I think that's I think the one thing I wish that someone had told me when I was starting out is that you don't have to begin at the beginning of a book. <laughs> I've always struggled. I think beginnings are, um, the beginnings of novels are always the, always the bit I rewrite and rewrite m more than any other part, actually, because often, I don't know if you find this, Stephanie, but often you set out with one idea and you think, okay, this novel is going to go from A and then I'm going to go to B. But often as you're writing along, somewhere along the way, you completely change your mind and you think, no, actually, I'm going to C or D or even E or F. Um, so and then of course you have to go back and make the beginning fit your fit your new ending so so it doesn't matter where you start as long as you actually get words on paper just start in the middle start at the end start halfway through you know third of the way through it doesn't matter just put those words down and then you've got raw material to work with I, I remember um hearing you I think it was when I interviewed you years ago um hearing you say exactly that and it was such a relief because I've heard so many writers talk about, you know, spending months making a sort of chapter by chapter plan. And then yeah, when you said that, I thought, I said, oh, that's what I do. It's completely all over the place. And, and I, you sort of find your way by writing it, which is yeah. I kind think of every, every part of the their shape. And every writer, every writer, I think, probably has a completely different method. And also probably a really different method for every book. You know, yeah. you just kind yeah. of feel your way and the book will eventually find its shape. So we've got another question uh, from Samara, who says, in North America, the book is titled Hamnet and Judith. Is there a reason for this? Um, it's, in, it's called Hamnet and Judith in Canada and Germany, I think. And I think the reason was they were worried about Hamnet being mixed up with some play or other. I don't know. Which oh, play. really? <laughs> um, OK, we're going to I think we've got time for one last question. Um, there's one here that... Um, when you mentioned mudlarking and the question is, do you find that surrounding yourself with trinkets and maps and uh, artifacts from the time helps you with writing a novel like Hamlet? Well, perhaps I'm, I'm not sure. I, it was certainly a kind of, there was some kind of, I needed to do some kind of physical labor to, to write this book and um, to find that connection just because there is such, you know, it's such a long time ago and, it is a very unfamiliar world you know that world is completely pretty much vanished. I mean yes you can go to Stratford extraordinarily you know for all of Shakespeare being a very mysterious person you can go to Stratford and walk into his house and honestly I would say anyone who has even the vaguest interest in books and literature to please go because it's the most extraordinary experience and nothing could ever replace it you know the Shakespeare birthplace trust has kept his house and it's kept well I mean his wife's house is different you know it, it would have looked very different in her day but it's there and you can walk through those doors and you can walk on the flagstones and it seems extraordinary because it's such a long time you know it's yeah. almost half a century since those people were living so I think I don't know I mean it's not so much that they're talismans but I think it's a kind of anything that helps you feel that connection with your characters from so long ago is, is always a good thing. Fantastic I think um, on that note we're going to have to leave it there um, we've run out of time sadly um, it's been so brilliant hearing you talk about this Maggie thank you so much for joining us um, I just wanted to tell people watching at home um, you can buy copies of Hamlet through the Wigtown Book Festival website um, the, the events of the festival uh, are there are plenty more to come and they are all free but if you felt moved to donate so that the festival can, can continue in its physical form uh, in years to come that would be fantastic and you'll also find information about how to donate on the website as well so um, thank you Wigtown for having us and thank you so much Maggie Farrell for a brilliant talk. A pleasure thank you so much thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye.